episode of the Alaska Outdoors podcast. I'm your host, Caleb Barton, and today we have Tyson Steele with us. Tyson Steele recently was a small town famous around Alaska and many other places. You might have heard of his story when he spent 23 days uh, in the remote Alaska wilderness after his cabin uh, tragically burnt down. Uh, Tyson, thanks for joining us. I appreciate your time. Uh, how you guys, How you doing down there? I'm doing all right. I'm uh... I'm recovering a a little bit, gaining back some weight that I lost. Uh, It's a pleasure to be on the show and and, uh, chat about my experience. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, just before we jump in to uh, to the details, I guess. We can give everybody a little little background information here. Um, I know uh, most people don't generally come to Alaska, you know, and go straight into – um, having a remote cabin into Squintna, uh, takes a little preparation. So why don't you just kind of give us yeah. a little background of, uh, how you ended up, um, being in a cabin in Squintna and what led you into, uh, wanting to go out there and living off the grid. Yeah. So, uh, my adventure, it kind of, it goes back quite a long ways. Um, uh, even though I've lived in Utah most of my life, I, grown up with lots of stories of Alaska and my family. Uh, my grandpa lived on the, the Bering Sea uh, in a little Yupik village called Hooper Bay. And he hunted and fished and trapped with the, with the natives there. And that's actually where my dad was born. Um, and and they, moved, they moved back to Utah at a young age, but with all the stories of Alaska, I just was always always intrigued and wanted to get there. Um, so I, uh, years down the road, I, I find, i I find a job at an, at Admiralty Island at a fishing lodge. And as of around 2014, uh, I just worked for the summer, uh, but was of course addicted to it. Uh, and I, I knew, knew from the moment that I pulled up, uh, fresh crab from the sea. I'm like, I got to have this in my life daily. Uh, it It's just too good to just be able to drop a pot and grab a whole bunch of crab. Uh, and just, just the wildlife, the scenery, the silence, clean air, clean water, all that stuff was very attractive to me. So I started, I started having my eye out on the market. Um, I I looked at all the listings for property and ideally I would have liked southeast but you can find an acre for $500,000 with no cabin on it you know it's it's really expensive in southeast uh, I would have liked to be there on the riverfront to catch halibut and uh, get sick of black tailed deer stuff like that but I knew I would never be able to afford that so I just kept looking looking um, and my eyes were drawn to the Matanuska Susitna borough, uh, because there were some really remote parcels out there for pretty cheap. And, uh, around, uh, 2017, I found a parcel, uh, 40 acres for 16,000 bucks. I was like, Whoa, that's <laughs> not a bad price. That's <laughs> yeah. That's like, one uh, percent uh, of the cost of Southeast, and and I I thought it was a scam at first because I I had some friends in Alaska that got scammed. I I had a buddy that uh, even built a cabin from property he thought he bought, and it was on native land, and so he just had to leave. Oh uh, wow. yeah, that's so pretty tragic yeah. to have to yeah do all that much work to get remote to find out you know you own something yeah. to be all out that yeah. money yeah so he, he he warned me he said you, you know be careful with listings so I, I call up a couple agents and they say it it's everything looks good uh apparently the the lady who owned it had never been there bought it like 30 years ago and uh completely completely hard to access. Um, and I, I didn't know exactly what was there, but I bought it sight unseen for, for 16,000 bucks. If it's just dirt, 
well, at least, at least it's not a huge loss. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so I purchased it and I didn't get there till about nine months after I purchased it in, uh, I got there in September, 2018 and, oh, it, it was rough. I, uh, I got a float plane. I chartered a float plane to land on a, a lake. But when we got to this lake, it was the pilot was uncomfortable with landing on it. So he landed on another lake that was three miles away instead of a half mile away. Wow. <laughs> so, so I've got like 2,000 pounds of gear. I've got a couple buddies with me. We land on this lake, and surrounding the lake, it's just all marshland. It, it takes all day just to get all that gear, just a quarter of a mile to our camp. And then the next day we make another camp a quarter of a mile away. The next day, another camp a quarter of a mile away. And I start realizing, I'm like, I'm not going to get any of this gear to my property by the end of the month. I, I had only, I had only uh, planned for, for being a month up there and I wanted to build something. So I, I ditched a lot of the gear. I had to, I had to package it away, tie it all up. And I just had headed to the property and I didn't, I didn't get there till day seven and just, just started camping out. And I was very, I was very pleased with the property. At first I was a little nervous. I'm like, Whoa, there's lots of marshland, lots of bugs. <laughs> and, but it's, it's kind of on a hill. It's well-drained. It's completely forested with good timber. Uh, it's bordering a river, not, not a, Boaty, boatable river, but just a creek. Mm -hmm. uh, it has some fish in it. Caught some coho salmon while we were up there. And uh, yeah, spent the next few weeks enjoying it. And that's when I met uh, uh, met an old homesteader out there. Um, his name was Mike. He he was a Vietnam War veteran, and and he had lived there for twenty years. Didn't know anything about the outside world um, other than the last thing he really remembers was like 9-11. So he thought the world was going to crap uh, and he was just out there disconnected from everything. He, he grew all of his own food. Uh, he, he didn't know what YouTube was. He didn't know what Facebook or Google was. He, he had no idea, but he was really happy. And I was really intrigued with that. Uh, he became a good friend over the years, or uh, not the years, over the next months. And that's when I went to become a winter caretaker at a lodge to kind of establish my residency. And uh, he he passed away in 2019, in summer. Uh, and I purchased his property. And so now I was one leg up on my, my homesteading plan. First, I had that 40 acres that was just raw land, almost impossible to get to. But now that I had his property, it was a well-established homestead. And the, the biggest benefit was the private airstrip he had. So instead of landing so far away, it land right there on, on the property. And that was very, very attractive to me. S such a time saver. Oh, man. Oh yeah, a lot of people, you know, they think um, wilderness or wild lands. Um, if they're listening from another state or a different um, area, more populated area, and you know, they're thinking wild lands. They're thinking, you know, a couple miles. You know, that's no big deal hauling hauling gear out there. But when you're in interior Alaska, like um, you know. Even squid yeah. is not completely interior, but that's wild land. I mean, you without it carrying anything. I mean, it could take hours sometimes going through those marshlands during hunting season. You know, you're yeah. slogging along bugs and weather and up and down through the tussocks. I mean, that's no joke yeah. and to be able to it, buy into uh, another homesteader's property that has already done. I mean, the amount of work it takes just to put in that airstrip. I mean, that's... It, oh uh, yeah. Uh, depending on the size of the airstrip, you know, even a cub strip, you're looking at, you know, 30, 40 foot wide, you know, quarter mile long uh, strip of land you're looking at clearing to get get a plane in and out yeah. of there safely. So 
mass and finding and flat, them. flat. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and taking all the rocks and roots and all the things that you know could just put you in a more dangerous situation every time you land there. That's huge. Yeah. So the airstrip alone was was worth the price I spent on that second parcel. Um, but I have even even more than an airstrip. I have uh, a couple outbuildings and had a cabin. So it was it was i pounced right on that as soon as i could oh yeah so so at this point this is um 2018 that you picked up his property uh 2018 was the first property i picked up and then 2019 uh september was was uh this new property so total total of 80 acres out there uh, and i moved out there as of september Okay, so uh, September, you you picked up his property. You just finished working the summer at Admiralty Island, and then uh, you're kind of prepping and getting yourself ready to go into winter, or what are you doing at this point? Yeah, so uh, winter prep was my first goal. Uh, I He already had cut a whole bunch of firewood, uh, probably about half winter supply, so I didn't have a whole lot of work to do there. Um, I spent, I spent a good few weeks just doubling what firewood I had, um, and I, I had a good supply, and, I, and there was really only a little bit of time I could do work in between um, when I arrived in September and the first snow. So uh, I, I just was focused on buttoning everything down, making sure I have food and warmth, basically. And I, I had a I had a two year supply of food actually. Well, did unfortunately, you? Uh, oh, go ahead. Unfortunately, I didn't have any um, capacity for uh, freezing any food at that point. Um, which I'll I'll do that next year because uh, I had a, a lot of meat that I caught over the summer. Um, I had uh, a a deer. Uh, but not much, but 35 pounds of meat and uh, like 150 f- pounds of of fish, of uh, halibut, salmon, and bass, and all that stuff. Uh, I ended up just giving it away to family uh, because I knew I couldn't store it. So when you're uh, middle of September, you're getting ready to prep, uh, going out there. You're you flew in and with all this, um, your two year supply, or you'd been slowly building it up over time out there, coming back and forth, or did you make one last voyage and just kind of plan on bringing as much stuff as you can, landing on your airstrip there? Uh, the old guy that lived there, he he already had uh, about a year supply of food, uh, rice and flour. Uh, a lot of canned food, a lot of top ramen, macaroni and cheese, uh, beans, all the necessities. And I just, uh, I just took a few plane rides out of, of more stuff, uh, some fresh stuff. Uh, I, I had two planes full of food um, come in initially in September, so about 800 pounds of food almost. And then I had a second plane in November. It was a very tricky plane ride in November. Um, November 5th. I remember, remember the 5th of November. Uh, I, uh, I uh, had some fresh stuff come in, like some veggies and potatoes. And that was basically my cutoff. Uh, after, after that fresh food went out, I was going to be relegated to uh, – canned foods and stuff like that and whatever whatever i could hunt i didn't have a chance to bag a black bear which i was hoping to but um i'm not sure how i would have been able to preserve that anyway so so you're out there um from september through november you got a few flights coming in got food at this point temp's starting to drop considerably we uh we actually started getting winter here i think it was around um middle of december that we actually got winter here but um how, what was the weather like during this time as it's starting to uh starting to get into the colder months out there uh so the the day that i got that uh last plane in november 5th uh it was pretty sketchy there were six inches of snow on the airstrip 
there was some really dense fog. It, it was it was hard to even find the airstrip. We thought we were going to have to turn around. I, I had gone into town to sign some paperwork and and co- collect the food, so I was on the plane. But we found it. We landed, and just barely was able barely was able to get out of there. And uh, yeah, it was it was in the it was in the twenties at that time. And shortly after that, maybe mid November, it started dropping, dropping down to the single digits, I think. And by the time the night of the fire, which was mid December, uh, it was negative 15 degrees. And into my survival ordeal, it got well into the negative 30s. It was like a record cold spell in that area. And, uh, it was it was significantly cold. If you've never been to a dry cabin or a remote type cabin, um, kind of lay out the picture. Uh, what what you know? What's your day consist of? Waking up out there, and what what are you doing to for basic amenities? I mean, everything is basically wood stove. You have no electric generator out there. Uh, is that correct? You basically only have wood heat and no running water. Yeah, uh, no running water, just wood heat. I did have a a battery bank uh, with uh, about six car batteries that I just used to keep my cell phone charged uh, and my Garmin inReach and VHF radio. Uh, I I did have a little suitcase generator, and uh, uh, I actually had a good supply of of gas and diesel, which is something that the media has kind of skipped over. Um, because it, it it sounds a little better of a survival story if you don't have those things. Right. Right. (laughs) Um, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't going out with nothing. I had a, I had a really good supply and I needed gas to run my, uh, four wheeler, um, and my snow machines and wood splitter and, uh, chainsaws all that stuff and my my diesel to to run uh, I have a tractor out there with four attachments uh, a mower uh, an excavator little thing um, a, a backhoe attachment and uh, some forks uh, a whole bunch of other attachments and uh, I also have a this old man uh, built a, a sawmill out of it's crazy. He built it out of an airplane engine. Oh wow! So, so like an like an otter or something, and it's just super loud. You crank it up, it's just like an airplane taking off, and it runs this huge mill that cuts twenty foot logs. Um, and uh, the sawmill shed has an entire wall that opens that's thirty feet wide. You can you can get the forks, the tractor, set a log down, and and mill. Of course, at that time, I at those temperatures, I couldn't run it. Um, I couldn't run any of the generators or anything. Um, but I was still, just to give you an idea of how well stocked I was, I I had uh, some really good outbuildings that uh, had some good supplies, which helped uh, save me through this ordeal. So um, moving into the colder months there um your days typically you just kind of wake up stock the fire um keeping supplies as you're moving towards what was uh uh when the fire took place that was mid-december or was that later yeah yeah mid-december so yeah my typical day um i i would do a a decent amount of hiking i i had a a regular routine of of hiking around the the uh property i had a trail carved and uh i would try to hunt some some grouse here and there um some spruce hens and th- those were tasty uh i i wanted to go out to the lake to go fishing but uh i didn't quite make it out that way uh it, i there's a lake nearby it's just a half mile away um and uh i was working on uh debarking logs during that time to prep to build a cabin in the spring. And I was building little things here and there. Um, I like fine woodwork, so I have a bunch of really nice hand planes. And I kind of set up a little shop inside my cabin where it was warm, where I could plane some uh, 
planks to make cabinets and stuff. I, I was making some kitchen cabinets at the time. Um, all went up in flames. So what's your, what kind of, sh- um, cabin you're looking to build a cabin in the spring so the cabin you're staying in is not really a permanent um type of shelter that you're looking to stay in out there long term wise um kind of what are what can we uh kind of get an idea of what you're staying in currently or we're staying in currently sorry yeah so the the old the old man had not intended on living it in it as long as he had he just started getting sick and old he he died at 79 years old uh, it was amazing that he could even uh, function out there the way he did. So he was just trying to eke out as much time as he could in this cabin, even though it was pretty dilapidated. Uh, it was just made, it's kind of Quonset hut style, uh, just li- uh, like a Viking longhouse made of one by fours and uh, greenhouse plastic. So I was basically living in a, in a greenhouse. Now, I didn't like the idea of that, but at least it was a shelter. Um, All that plastic made me nervous um, being a fire starter. Uh, And the wood, he never treated the wood, so it, it, whatever was near the surface or in the, in the ground, it was rotting away. And, oh, there were so many mice in the walls. It was, it drove me insane almost. So many mice and shrews and, uh, even a river otter or something made its way into the ceiling, and I tried setting out traps and couldn't. I couldn't trap it. It was a sneaky little bastard. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine just being in some of the remote cabins. And uh, August, I stayed in one as a German-made cabin up in the mountains. And uh, you know, I woke up two or three times. You know, when I was staying there, shine my headlamp in the middle of the night, and there's. There's two or three mice just made home. I mean, this is their home just as oh, much yeah. as it is my temporary home, you know, so I can imagine yeah. uh, long-term, you know, any kind of plastic, insulation, anywhere warm, you know, all those little mm-hmm. rodents and critters are, you know, they're the same thing we're looking for, you know. They're looking at a place to stay warm and hide too, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really gross. Uh, you know, they just they just crap in all the walls and it stinks. Um I was hoping to get a cabin built uh, real soon. So you're staying in the cabin at this point, and it's uh, uh, winter time now. You're looking for stuff to eat, looking, um, and you basically have no communication with the outside world. They're getting a little bit here and there. Or what's uh, what's going on there? No, so I um, my area was just on the per- periphery of the available service, so. Um, I could find a spot on my phone and I could get a pretty good connection uh, if I stood outside and I had weekly contact with my parents. Um, That's kind of a thing that the old man did that he taught that he told me was important to just check in. And that's what I do. I just say, give them some updates. I'm doing well. Here's what I, here's some of my adventures. Uh, See you next week. So I had that as my first line of communication. And then I had a Garmin inReach in case my phone uh, went bad, which it was a pretty crappy phone. It, right out of the box, it started having charging issues and stuff like that. Um, and then I also had a VHF Marine radio. Um, so, so I had all those, all those backups. And uh, my problem was because of those uh, uh, issues with my phone, I would sometimes be late. Mm-hmm. to uh, my check-ins and it actually happened to be the night of the fire that I was 10 days from my last check-in I checked in with my parents and said I'm doing all right and boom the fire happened so at that moment I'm like I have 10 days at least before anyone's even worried about me um, and uh, that that was kind of disheartening um, what well, my, my, my other problem was that I had all my communication devices in one location for charging mm-hmm. and that's pretty much where the fire started. So almost instantly all those three devices were, were gone. 
So I was reading um, a few different articles online, one from uh, the Alaska State Troopers and a few other people, and you think your wood stove kind of uh, started the fire or kind of take us through that uh, or maybe the day before and uh, through that night and what uh, what actually started and when you started, you know, the really realizing, you know, things are getting out of control. Yeah, so it was the night of uh... – the 16th or 17th uh, at about one in the morning, I, I woke up pretty cold. I, I didn't uh, stock my fire well enough before I fell asleep. So I woke up at one in the morning. Um, I checked the thermometer. It was negative 15 outside. It was, uh, it was about 40 degrees inside. And I just kind of shook my head. Ah, stupid. Why did I, why did I not stock the fire before? I went to bed. Uh, so I quickly built a, a fire and I broke one of my cardinal rules is to not use cardboard in a fire. Uh, and I used a rather big one, a r rather big piece of cardboard. I loaded some, some kindling and some logs onto that, lit it, got a blaze going real quickly. But uh, I little did I know until I put two and two together that a piece of that cardboard flew up the chimney that didn't have a spark arrestor uh, to my dismay when I got to the property. Um, but a man does what he can with what he has, right? Right. So the, the cardboard goes up the chimney, lands on a portion of the roof that has plastic, and it ignites. And I – I don't know this until I start going back to bed. I'm, I'm falling asleep and a hole in the ceiling starts to appear and there's, there's fire dripping, dripping in like these little plastic drips into my room and lighting up the room or all around me. And, uh, it was kind of close to the pipes. So I thought at first it's a creosote fire, which, which is uh, homesteaders worst fear, right? But it didn't make sense to me because I had regularly cleaned out the creosote. Um, so uh, I did a, an old trick that a sourdough taught me is to just uh, throw some snow on the coals in the, in the wood stove to put it out. Um, so I go outside for snow, and I do that. The, the steam's pretty hot. But when I opened the door and I looked all around, there were no signs of the creosote. Uh, it being a creosote fire it was you're, it's supposed to get real hot and you you, you you smell this really iron hot smell and you can see fire coming out of the out of the sides of the chimney and stuff but i didn't see any of that so i concluded that it was pro it was that cardboard and when i go outside for some more snow my conclusion is confirmed when i see that the whole roof above my room is on fire and it's spreading quickly and i just realized i don't have hardly any time i only have seconds to react so i go back into my house i grab up i grab a bunch of gear whatever's within arm's reach uh like some some jackets and uh some sleeping bags that were in the area there's lightweight ones and wrap it up in a blanket and run out run out the door while trying to urge my dog out of the door and he was terrified huddled up on huddled up on the bed trying to get away from the flames he's a big old 110 pound chocolate lab and i couldn't possibly carry him uh i got I finally got him off the bed but he escaped my vision and when i went around the other side to grab my rifle that's when i realized he was still in the house and it was too late. The roof had collapsed and he was, um, it was horrible. He was howling. And um, this, uh, this is something I, I haven't, I've kind of skipped over in the media because non Alaskans don't really understand what I had to do next. But the ammunition that was in my rifle, my 338, I tried to put him out of his misery. I have, I have four shots. And I couldn't see him, but I was just hoping that a shot would hit him. Um, 
and it, it never did. And it, it was pretty horrifying because he was more than just a pet to me. He was, he was my companion up there, my, my best friend. Uh, so that was really hard. And I just, Oh, I just yelled into the air. Um, having not been able to do anything about it, save him or even put him out of his misery. It was rough. Yeah. I can only um, imagine. I mean, we, uh, we take our dogs literally everywhere we go, you know, and a guy that when you find a good dog, you know, that travels well with you and you take him and we've been there your whole life with him, you know, and you're spent, you spend times in the mountains of the woods. So anybody who's, uh, spent a copious amount of times out outside and, has a good dog that uh they've trained yeah. well and they could basically talk to you know our uh our 10 year old aussie you Absolutely. know he, he knows us so well that you know you don't really have yeah. to you know you guys can communicate on a level where you know each other you know so i can only imagine oh, yeah. that most people you know they read an article like that you know why didn't he save his dog and it's just like it's pretty easy for people to be you know armchair warriors on one side of the one of the fence without reading that and seeing, you know, the whole in-depth situation. I can only imagine how hard that situation would yeah. be trying to put my dog down so he wouldn't suffer. But I think a lot of Alaskans who uh, who knew a dog like that and has have a dog like that or owned a dog like that would probably think pretty similar in the same situation. You know, nobody wants their dog yeah. suffering. And when they're basically your family, you know, you treat them just like you would if that was, you know, a brother or sister or whatever that, you know, yeah. their, their family. So. Yeah. That it was honestly the hardest part of the whole event. Um, j just, I had survival skills, but the mental, the mental aspect of that, that was, that was tough. So after, you know, the fire, I imagine plastic, you know, went up, uh, pretty fast and it's burning pretty hot what's kind of happening at this situation you just kind of standing there you know standing with negative 15 out i mean you probably cool down pretty fast after the adrenaline wears off and everything's burning uh what are you thinking what's going through your mind at this point um i collapsed in the snow for uh, a, a little bit just kind of shell shocked and my like, heart wrenching uh but I didn't spend too much time because I realized my food was now burning. Um, I would have, in hindsight, um, I would have put my food in like a separate cache like like you're supposed to do. I read that in a lot of uh, Alaskan homesteading books. And uh, because I was out there so late in, in the season, I, I didn't have time to make one. And I was instantly regretting that. Um, but I, I had to do what I could to save what food was burning. Of course, all the dry goods like the flour and the rice and the, and the noodles and pastas, they, they were all pretty much instantly burning. And I spent, I spent a good time, a, a good amount of time late into that night er, and early into the morning putting out the fire around the pantry. And it, and it was terrifying because, uh, all my rounds of ammunition were going off. I had like 500 rounds, shotgun shells, uh, 22s, 44s, you name it. And they were all going off. Of course, it can't really do any harm because there's no barrel uh, putting it in any trajectory, but it's still scary. Um, and it's right next to the food and the propane tanks are on fire. It's right next to the food. And it was just all the cards were stacked against me. I finally got enough cans to have two cans a day for 30 days. Um, just what whatever had survived, and most of those cans were um, burst burst open, and so they had all this gross plasticky smoke inside them, and everything tasted horrible, just horrible, like uh, yeah. like plastic. And because the snow had been melting around it, it was kind of soaking in this snow charcoal watery soup for a while as it as it as the fire went out. Um, so it it was it was just really gross. And but I had to eat it. And unfortunately, the old man he had food still there that I didn't like or even was allergic to like pineapples. 
he had pineapples and a good amount of those survived. And I, I ate them anyways, even though I had, uh, my, my, I had a hard time breathing and, uh, my neck was closing up and all that stuff. Just eat little bits at a time. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was not <laughs> a bad deal. Yeah. So after, um, that you get the fire put out, uh, what kind of state are you in at this point? Uh, do you know, are you staying in one of the outcropping buildings, uh, trying to find what clothes do you have on? I mean, you basically everything just went up in flames. So, I mean, what, 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 what do you look like at this point? And what is, yeah. you know, what's your plan of attack? Yeah. So all I had was my pajamas, basically like, uh, long drawn bottoms, a long sleeve shirt and, uh, my winter boots, I, I was able to grab those, but I had no socks on. Um, I, I I had grabbed a couple jackets, a lightweight summer jacket, a QU jacket, um, and uh, and a down jacket, and that that provided some nice warmth. Um, and I had a wool sweater. Th- those those all combined were a little bit of a tight fit, layer, layering it up versus my parka but it it was good for my for my core but my legs were still pretty exposed um i i found i found in a shed later uh some extra clothes from the old man but they were from like the 80s and they were infested with mice and they were under a place in the shed that had a drip in it so they were frozen but I found a snow machine suit, which was which was a nice uh, over over the top of everything uh, protection. It was just canvas, so it 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 was old and it was it was honestly crumbling to dust and frayed, torn at the crotch and at the armpit. Um, but at least it was something. It it stunk like no other. Um, so, so I put that on. I didn't find that till maybe, um, till maybe day seven or eight, something like that. The the night of the fire, or that the next day, I was so exhausted that all I could think of was just build a snow cave and huddle up inside and sleep because I I was just so tired. So, I built this one snow cave that was just barely enough to fit my body, and I huddled up in in the blankets and sleeping bags I was able to grab and, uh, and stayed two nights in there. And when the, when the fire finally cleared, um, I, I had to think of my options. I couldn't stay in a snow cave if I was going to be out there for three weeks, which I figured was my timeline. Uh, the outbuildings weren't really an option because they had huge, they had huge doors that, that, um, weren't closed, just big openings, like um, 15 feet wide by 10 feet high, so you can drive a tractor into it. So, so I, it would have taken a lot of work to try to heat something that big with a big opening. So I ditched that. I figured my best bet, the my wood stove was still standing after the fire. Why not just clean out all the bur- bur- the debris and and build something around that. So that's what I did. It took it took uh, about a week to build something that was closed off enough that it would matter. I found some old pieces of tin to put behind the wood stove to reflect the heat toward me. And then I grabbed tarps, old lumber, even found some old insulation that was rat infested uh, to insulate a couple of the walls. And then when that was all said and done, uh, I buried I buried that structure partially in the snow, which you can kind of see from the SOS video that the helicopter took. You can you can see that structure how it's mostly buried, and that provided a decent amount of warmth, but it still wasn't like a a nice wall tent because I had to leave a gap between the pipe and the plastic so I wouldn't suffer another fire. So whatever heat was generated would go up the top. And it was maybe zero degrees inside that next uh, shelter, 
but at least it wasn't negative 30. It's a, that's a huge difference. Um, Definitely. So it took you seven days to build the structure that you um, eventually uh, kind of makeshift shelter you built. But just so, because uh, a lot of people, you know, they're thinking snow cave uh, might not be familiar with what that is exactly. I think some of the people who have a little bit of survival knowledge might might mm-hmm. be. But so are you saying you just dug a big hole in the ground and crawled inside or uh, just so for our listeners can picture it a little better? Yeah. So at the time, there was probably about uh, four feet of snow. Um and I, I dug a trench in that snow, and I put a tarp over the top of that trench. Well, some sticks first, and then a tarp, and I I buried that in in snow. And the snow has good insulating properties. Um, it can inside a snow cave, it can stay pretty warm actually. If if I had a candle, I could have lit the candle, and I can you can get it above 30 degrees. Uh, I didn't, but, uh, my body heat kept it warm enough to where maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was zero degrees, maybe even 10 degrees inside. And it kept the, the weather out, um, any breeze it kept out. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was fairly comfortable, all things considered. Um, I, I was cold, but it, it protected me me from the elements. So he kind of can kind of see that with a a trench and a, and a tarp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's basically like kind of created a, another Kwanzaa hut, like a miniature Kwanzaa hut uh, covered with snow. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And you can actually see the sort of dome shape from that helicopter video because what I used is some old, uh, old timber that the guy had already curved, um, to to give it structural strength um and uh yeah i I built it just after the old guy's designs basically and because of that curve it could take a lot of a lot of snow weight Um, i was gonna build it nice i knew i had a long time to be be there i was gonna i was gonna just piece it together even though i mean it is pretty pieced together um i needed to be comfortable in order to be sane because now it's a mental battle. I, I've i got all the firewood I need for the winter. I've got enough food for 30 days, miserable, terrible food. But if I'm not sane, I'm going to get depressed, and I'm going to curl up in a ball and just want to die. So why not be comfortable, right? At least modestly. Right. So you so you built um, – you got a decent shelter with the snow cave. I had a lot of people might disagree with us, but uh-huh. – uh, We'll we'll say you got a, a somewhat decent a survivable shelter at this point, uh-huh. um, and you start working on your uh, makeshift shelter. What's going through your head at this point? I mean, you know you got you're gonna miss uh, your check in point in ten days, right? The fire happened, and then you have ten more days from the fire till when you're supposed to check in again. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you got a minimum of 10 days before even people are going to even begin to start looking for you at this point. Yeah. I mean, what, what is going through your head is your, I mean, are you just trying to stay focused on, you know, your survival, um, priorities at this point? Um, but is there any doubt running through your mind? I mean, what did at any point where you like, you know, I'm kind of screwed out here and nobody is going to look or did you have to, you know, how'd that mental battle go? What, what kind of thoughts were running through your head during this time? What, what you said about staying focused was, was key. Uh, adrenaline was still pumping and I just thought I need to stay focused. Um, I, I was pretty sad. Like I was going to miss Christmas check-in and that was, that was a little depressing. And I kind of, tried not to dwell on hoping for a miracle so i thought oh, what if i miss christmas and then everyone's just worried and they send a chopper and I'm, and I, I think about that so often but i'm like that's it's not going to happen it, it's just not going to happen so i had to force hopeful thoughts out of my head i i had to be happy and comfortable but not too uh not too uh, 
mythical thinking, you know, that that wasn't realistic at all. So that got kind of depressing. Um, there, there was a lingering thought throughout the whole time that, that I, I was, I wasn't exactly like depressed enough to hurt myself, but my bullets were all gone. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing because it didn't, it, you know, a last resort, maybe I, I like, I'm not like suicidal or anything, but who knows what I could have done in that state of mind. And that occurred to me at a minor level. And I had to force that out of my head, of course. Um, And uh, there were nights, I remember specifically day 17, it was so cold that I peed in a bucket inside my snow cave and it froze in just a minute. And and I just huddled up in my sleeping bag and was shaking, like almost hypothermic for the entire night. And I just remember thinking, I just let me die, you know, just let me go peacefully. Let me die. Let me not wake up and everything will be good. Um, but one thing that that kept gnawing at me is that I didn't want to go. I had things to do, and I didn't want there to not be a story. Um, like, I didn't want people to show up and see, okay, what happened, uh, and speculate. Oh, did he did he eat his dog? You know, and that would have been a horrible last last uh, impression that uh, my story is written after I'm dead, and it's all wrong. You know, I. I didn't want my memory to be wrong. So that, that kept me alive to just kind of think about that. I don't know if that makes sense. It, well, it does in, uh, in the sense that I think a lot of people, you know, when you're in scenarios and things um, start happening, you know, is there, you know, a script on what you should be thinking or how you're thinking? No, people, you know, everybody's perspective's a little different and what's going to go through your mind and what keeps you alive versus somebody else and what's going to keep driving you forward, you know? I think yeah. the biggest part is whatever um, is, you know, that driver just holding on to it and, you know, pushing yourself to keep, you know, surviving in this uh, scenario, you know, no matter what the person, you know, situation might be, you know, uh, everybody's got to have something that is pushing them and is their motivation to keep on going. I don't think, uh, yeah. you know, whether it's, you know, no, that's, in, that's it's interesting. Easy, you know, I think a lot of people are going to sit on, you know, it's easy to say here, you know, look at your situation and read about it on the newspaper and be like, oh, you should have done this or you should have done that. Or, you know, reading about somebody who tragically is fatally found in a scenario and say, well, why didn't he just do this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I've tried to avoid comments because of that. Oh, yeah. The social media these days, you know, the opinions and stuff go all over the place, but you know, until they've been in that scenario and, uh, seen what is actually happening, then it's, it's really hard to, uh, hard to really, uh, have a place to talk. So, um, I mean, I've, I'll be honest with you. I've never been outside for three weeks and, (laughs) you know, negative 15, (laughs) negative anything, whether it was in this day and age, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, wouldn't even be able to go live in your cabin you remotely and not have human contact for 10 days you know yeah Um, yeah. especially willing to go do that and no plumbing i mean that that seems pretty crazy for some people so um so at this point um you know you got your makeshift shelter put together Mm-hmm. And um, you're staying in that. It's barely above zero. What? When did you start staying full time in your makeshift shelter? Uh, that was about uh, day day eight or nine. I think, I think. everybody kind of puts together a uh, a long term plan, or, or what? Kind of what are you thinking? You know, what is? You know, do you have a plan A if nobody hears? You know, from this point, or what? What are you doing too? Uh, to have people, you know, try to find you at this point or what's your plan to be found? Yeah, so um, I 
I knew that, so my family has my GPS location. They know exactly where I am. Um, I didn't, I didn't think that, um, leaving, uh, leaving was out of the question for me. I, I didn't think that it would take that long that after 10 days, um, or maybe by new year's, I knew that absolutely my parents were going to be worried having missed Christmas and having missed new year's. I also had a couple of friends that I was in contact with more than my, more than my parents, like every few days I'd talk to them. So I figured somewhere along the line, someone's going to be making calls to see what the heck's going on. Um, so uh, I, I did entertain the notion of leaving. I started working on my snow machine to see if I, if that would be an option, but it was old and there was too much snow. It would just get bogged down within just a hundred yards. And in fact, it's out there right now, just stuck in, in snow, just a hundred yards from my cabin. I, I couldn't get it very far at all there's just too much snow it's an old machine and old gas so the carburetor is getting all plugged up um so i i walking out was going to be difficult i i did all my snowshoes burned up i could make some um in fact i found some frames that i started working on repairing but even then i wouldn't just make a gung-ho trek to squintna which was 20 miles away, I was going to first go to um, another neighboring cabin, cabin, which is only a mile away. That's not too bad, right? I didn't initially, I didn't initially go there just because after all the events, I hurt my leg pretty bad. I, to I tore my MCL a year ago, and I re-injured it kind of in this thing. Um, there were two rivers to cross to go to that cabin a mile away. I didn't, it's just a summer cabin just for a couple weeks. So there's not going to be firewood. Uh, if people just go there to hunt during September, they don't have a winter supply of firewood. Um, and who knows if they have any food at all, you know, they, they might have some, but, and then, and then that begs the question. I break into someone else's cabin. Um, he's my neighbor and he knows me, so he'd be fine with it. But what if I'm endangering someone else? So it, so all that, it's, it's, it's fairly far to travel. I don't know how well stocked it is. I, I wasn't going to do that right off the bat. I was going to wait until maybe day 25 to head that way. And, Perhaps he shows up or something. Perhaps, perhaps there's some internet. I, I have no idea um, what's there, and it could have been an option. But I, I didn't have the clothing to really go out for long periods of time. Um, so, yeah, th does that make sense? I was kind of, I was just kind of worried to oh, go. Oh yeah, there's even I a mean, mile. a lot of people. I mean, um, I think when you survival scenarios they always recommend you know staying where you're at uh to begin with right uh there has to if you have the resources yeah. and supplies mm -hmm. you know it'd be hard to talk yourself into moving anywhere away from your you know because yeah heat at this point uh, at least enough heat to survive you got enough food to survive for 30 days it's hard to talk yourself into walking away from those resources out into the wilderness and yeah. really, you know, have a yeah. viable option of um, rescue at that point. Um, yeah, because who knows? Like, what if the the day I leave, say day twenty five, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go to the other cabin, but the chopper heads out that day, right? Yeah, you know, and land on my property doesn't see me and has to interpret my tracks to locate me. That's that's not that's not a good deal. That's a bad deal. Right. So you're at this point you're just kinda huddling in this makeshift shelter with your sleeping bags up next to a wood stove. Um, just mm -hmm. praying and hoping that somebody flies over or your family eventually calls um calls for rescue or a check in. Um uh, after talking with them, did you uh 
did they ever mention how long um, they hadn't heard from you when they really started getting worried or when uh, when the call went out or how did um, how did you end up getting rescued or uh... so yeah I found out in uh, later that uh, they called around January 2nd uh, it was after the new year and they're like something's going wrong and originally it was just meant to be a private affair with my pilot and willow they were going to call him they thought he's got to have battery issues so we'll send him an airdrop of supplies with some charging cords and batteries and whatnot and we'll just drop it and the pilot will rear on it if, if if everything looks good um but the pilot, he he started getting a little nervous and said, you know, I think, I th- this is, I think this is something's wrong here, and uh, he was also concerned with how cold it was. He didn't want to fly out privately and just cause a worse of a rescue situation. Um, it was well into the negative 30s during that, at that time, and yeah, he was worried, so he forwarded. Uh, the, he, he gave the number of the troopers to my parents, and they called. And even the troopers, uh, they they had bad weather at the time, and they couldn't get out in their chopper. So they waited and waited for the perfect window. And it wasn't until the 9th or the 10th, I, I think it was the 9th, where the ice fog around Anch- Anchorage cleared up, and they were able to fly out about an hour's flight. And they, it, it was rather quick after that. It was a quick drop and pick up. I didn't have anything to take with me. So I just I di- ditched most of my gear and I left it as is. My whole, my whole makeshift shelter is exactly how I left it with sleeping bags and everything still there. They're going to be nasty when I get back. <laughs> so what, what are you just inside your makeshift shelter and you're laying there and hear a helicopter coming or what, what were you doing when, um, you know, and how did, the, how do they really know, you know, did they land nearby and come walking up and check on you or, uh, how did that whole scenario go down? So I, at the time I was uh, eating or I was cooking up the world's worst oatmeal <laughs> of all time because I, I, I had found a can in the fire and it was all blackened, you know? Oh, yeah. Charboiled oatmeal. So I, Sounds delicious. <laughs> I was heating up some water. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> and, I yeah, I heated up the water. I poured it in. I heard the chopper, and I was like, that's definitely for me. There's, there's hardly any air traffic in the area and never a helicopter, so... I kicked my boots on real quick, grabbed a, a jacket, went outside, and I started doing the classic SOS signal of just waving your arms calmly, uh, both arms all at once. And they spotted me. I suppose they probably had an exact location, so uh, it seemed like they were heading directly for me, not not just searching, but heading directly for me. And they made a couple circles around the property to confirm that it was me. And I pointed them to the airstrip. They landed. I ran over there and uh, they just asked me some basic questions. I was super happy to see a human face. And uh, I was, I was quickly off. I just grabbed a few things back at camp. Um, like uh there were a couple books that I had found. Just uh, there was an old book about an Alaskan trapper and his stories. Uh, I grabbed that, and they were kind of my companions during this whole thing. Uh, gave me something to do, and uh, yeah, it it was it was kind of crazy because it all happened so fast, and they were a little bit surprised at my good condition. Because strangely enough, uh, one of those troopers uh, was the guy that picked up the previous owner when he died, um, the old Vietnam vet, he, he died at the property. And so that trooper picked up a body. Oh, wow. So you can kind of imagine what he's thinking. Like, he's like, the last time I was up here, I picked up a body and now someone's in trouble. Uh, what am I going to find here? 
so it, that was that was kind of uh, that was kind of I was glad I wasn't a body. Um, and yeah, I get in that chopper and I feel I feel happy that I'm going to get a shower and get a meal, but there was just a bit of re- regret still, just sadness. Like I'm leaving my house. I've got so much work to do. Uh, uh, my dog's behind there. Uh, it was a lot of mixed feelings in that. Did I answer all your questions? I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, there's a, uh, <laughs> a couple questions um, from some of our audience that I just wanted to uh, make sure that we covered because I think it, uh, okay. some of the general audience might have uh, might have asked the same. Um, so one of our uh, one of the questions some people ask was it easy to stay calm and. Uh, what did you feel was the hardest part of the whole situation? Um, I definitely wasn't calm when my dog had died, and um, I made some I made some mistakes that uh, that could kind of cost me a little later on. Like, um, well, it's hard to say it was a mistake, but. I exhausted all of my bullets trying to put my dog out of his misery, right? Those were my last four bullets. And now I had no protection against moose or wolves. And um, there was a moose that came right up to my camp just 15 feet away. And in a survival situation, um, it I could have legally gotten it to survive, right? Um, I, I, I didn't want I didn't really want to waste all that meat, but you know, it's, that's what I would have done. And so, yeah, I wasn't calm during the fire, but I, I remained mostly calm uh, throughout the rest of the time, partially maybe pumped by adrenaline still that I just, I, all my identity was stripped away. I was like, I was like at an animal state almost just, All I have to do is think of three things, my fire, my, my, um, shelter and food. But, uh, no, actually I just remembered something that, that I, that caused me a good deal of panic. So I was pretty traumatized from the fire and during the night I would wake up all of the time, like almost every three hours thinking that everything was starting on fire again. So I'd, I'd rip off my sleeping bags and get ready to exit out, but nothing was going on. It was just all in my head. So that was pretty frightening. So you, but, Oh, go ahead. But all, all in all, like I, there were a lot of pleasant moments despite the tragedy. Like, uh, there was a be- there were beautiful northern lights one night, um, and then a couple weeks later there was there was a beautiful full moon. Um, the moose that came by it was just a beautiful big moose, and it was awesome to just look at it for a while, not not with any intent to kill it, no ability to kill it. It was just kind of cool to look at it and observe its behavior, and see tracks in the snow and and. You know, there are a lot of times where I'd find beauty in things, and a lot of times I'd find humor in things. Like when a can exploded the night of the fire and hit me in the face, and my face is wet, I think it's blood, and then I taste it, and it's chilly. <laughs> it's, uh-huh. yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, I, th- I think it's bullet a bullet that hit me. But uh, I had to laugh e- even in the terrible, grim moment. Um, just, just stay happy. Um, I don't know. I definitely think uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I think that definitely, um, you know, a lot of people that spend time in the bush or spend time outdoors in general uh, have, I mean, obviously can relate in a little bit of a sense to you know understanding the beauty in the situations, uh, even in that tragic mm-hmm. scenario where you're just kind of. You know, life sucks right now, but, you know, you're suffering through it and you're just enjoying the moments. And I mean, it's funny how Alaska has a funny yeah. way of doing that to you. <laughs> that... Yeah, yeah. I think uh, maybe a lot of Alaskans are uh, as crazy as me that 
maybe it's maybe it's a little craziness. <laughs> so there's a few other questions that I just wanted to make sure in case a couple of people were out there. Um, if you had to go back before the fire, uh, I kind of can guess what your answer would be. But going back before the fire, what would you make sure to do next time? Or what what are you going to do differently in the future uh, to change um, the outcomes or scenarios or prepare for them? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and that is one that rolled down, uh, rolled through my head the entire time. Uh, one of those uh, is pretty obvious. I'll I'll build two cabins. Um, I wanted to build another cabin, but I was just on a time constraint and was wasn't able to. Um, I will have my food stored in multiple locations, um, uh, dry food in one location, uh, other food in lo other locations. Um, and I think I'll probably even put my firewood in another location just, just in case that went up in flames, that, that would be disastrous. So have several different, uh, wood sheds. That would be, that would be great. Uh, my Garmin inReach, I would, I would definitely have that um, closer by at all times, um, so it's easily accessible. It seems like a good idea to put them all in a charging station, which is what I did, but uh, it was, it was just not close enough to my bed. I just put it right on my bed, or maybe clip it to my belt, even at night. I don't know. Um, you can also I I I uh, learned that you can have a, a a subscription to Garmin where you can have two devices. I'd consider that where you have one device with you and a spare device in another uh, building. That can be expensive, I think, but um, worth it. Uh, another thing, there was another thing that I was going to do differently. Um, Oh, I can't. I can't remember. There, there, there's a, there's a pretty big list. <laughs> I can imagine so being able to be in that scenario and now, looking back, I mean, I imagine that question would probably go through my head a lot of the time too. Is uh, I got to make sure to bring this and make sure to do this and, you know, uh, a whole set of uh, plan uh, going forward in the future. But what, uh, when, what are you looking at? Uh, doing in the future are you going to go back out there keep uh, living off the grid out there what's your uh, what's your future plans yeah i i still intend to to build um i'll i'll stay at that uh property for a while and i actually want to move up to that first property that i bought that's kind of up on the hill and uh it has a fairly good view um i i'm addicted to that solitary life it's it's just it just makes me completely happy like even even on my own i i really enjoy it so it's not even it it hasn't even really co crossed my mind to not go back like a lot of my friends in utah think i'm crazy uh they're like why would you do that and i'm like would you uh would you just walk away from your house if it burned down just be like oh well, time to move to Miami now, you know, like, uh, so, so yeah, it's, I'm definitely going back. I, oh, it's, it's great out there. It's so peaceful. Um, I just gotta, I just gotta have, uh, not all my eggs in one basket basket, if that's the right phrase. Yeah. Oh yeah. So basically just going forward you know when you step back out there again you know you're kind of just separate everything and be yeah. uh have more backup plan set set in place uh, yeah what uh, are mm -hmm. you going to build off the uh build off the land uh when you go back out there you said you mentioned you had a sawmill so i'm assuming you're gonna cut some logs and build that way or do you have that set plan out in the future what's your uh yeah i I have to, uh, I have to fix the, the sawmill. Um, when I started it, it's built out of an airplane engine, you know, so it's super loud and super scary. And there's like tons of buttons to press that I couldn't interpret. 
So I need to get like a, a diesel mechanic up there to uh, see how all the wiring works. Um, so, something was off and I couldn't engage the saw mechanism. Uh, so I, I'll have to work through that, but I don't think it'll be too hard um, to get that going. And if not, I'll have a, a chainsaw mill up there. I still have a few chainsaws. I just need a, I just need to get uh, a chain uh, mill attachment. And I'll just make something real small to start, you know, like a 10 by 10 um, with a low roof. And uh, I've got tin up there for a roof already. Um, and I've got some flashing for a stove. Uh, I, th I, think I, can, I think I can do it pretty cheap um, and get back on my feet. So going forward, when you head back out there, uh, what are some items you're probably going to take that, um, you know, maybe going forward in the future, is there a certain amount of gear that you take everywhere with you, or there's going to be some things that you take with you this time that, uh, you know, in the past you might not have taken uh, with you previously? Uh, I still have a lot of tools out, out there still. But I will, I will get a new chainsaw. Um, something that I will get that seems kind of strange at first. Uh, I will get a pair of uh, tree trimming loppers. You know, like uh, they're four feet long, and you can just uh, kind of cut like scissors. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, those type of loppers um, to cut branches and trim trees. Uh, in a survival situation where I uh, don't really want to use a, a saw or uh, whatnot, that can that's actually really really quick for building shelters. And uh, my mine was kind of damaged at the time, but uh, if I'm hiking along and I just need to keep my gloves on, um, it, it you know it seems strange to take that, but it's it's a, it does really quick work. And it's it's really efficient. Uh, I will take I will probably take a really nice new axe, uh, something with Swedish steel, uh, some woodworking axes as well. Um, something that, that I forgot to mention that I incorporated into my uh, shelter was I I found a roll of mylar later on, maybe around day. 15 and i was able to line the ceilings of my snow shelter with that mylar and it reflected a decent amount of heat back down so i'm going to get another roll of mylar because that's, that's valuable to to just put on the walls um it doesn't look doesn't look great but i in a survival situation you don't care about looks um uh, and then one other thing that I'm that I'm gonna do, and this is this is something that I thought about the entire duration of these 23 days, is I I want to make a pool behind mini shelter that can be dragged by a snow machine, and that's just it's just on a sled and it's the length of your body, and it's rounded, and has a hard shell on it. But with really thick insulation, so it, it's basically like a big sleeping bag that you can sit in, um, with a door and some breathing holes and stuff like that. But I think if you if you got one of these little uh, pull behind uh, shelters and you buried that in snow, it's like a, a snow cave on steroids, and it would be hugely valuable. Um, I've I've started designing a few things, um, a few ideas. There there's a guy on YouTube who's he's a Canadian guy and he's built a a pool behind little cabin that he can sit up in, just enough room to lay down at night, and it's it's brilliant. And I think I think that would be a great thing to have separate from your cabin, and you can just hop inside. In a survival situation, if your cabin burns down, or you can drag it hunting or something like that. Yeah, you know? be able to have instantaneous shelter <laughs> goes a long way, especially in temps well below zero. Um, yeah, 
So what for the crowds that uh for the everyday hikers and the people that are kind of pushing the limits um for outdoor gear and expeditions in general, what kind of gear do you think uh would you suggest that they would carry if they're gonna, you know, be spending time outdoors? What you know, is there any small things that um fire starters or certain kinds of brands of gear that um you carry that they might look at that might help them in uh scenarios if they got caught out in the woods or is there basic things um compass maps anything like that uh yeah so i already i i mentioned the garmin in reach i think i think that's that's huge but if, if you don't have the funds for that that it that's hard to come by especially if you're just a regular hiker you only do uh, little adventures here and there um if you're if you're out in the wilderness obviously a good pair of, or out in the snowy wilderness a good pair of snowshoes matters and I, I love the MSR brand of snowshoes. Um, they're they're really really efficient, really lightweight, and and super dur- durable. Uh, if you're in country where there's where there's uh, bears and wolves and moose and stuff, obviously a um, a gun. I I can't quote you on a brand there though. Um, whatever suits you for protection. Um, uh, I, I I could probably make a list if I really thought about it. Uh, on the spot, s- several different kinds of fire starters would be good. Of course, a, a bic lighter is is easy. Uh, waterproof matches are easy, but uh, flint and steel and uh, magnesium can be nice. I I really like magnesium for starting a fire. And uh, here's a here's a strange one. Um, you know the little sparkers that you can use to to make uh, uh, to spark uh, welding torches. Oh, yep. yep. I uh, I found one of those in a shed, and I actually had to use that in a pretty desperate situation where I had slept through the night and I let my fire in the wood stove die down, and all my means of starting the fire had burned up in the cabin. It was. It was stupid. I, I I admit it was stupid to have all my matches and lighters in a five gallon bucket inside the cabin. But so so when that fire went out, I I grabbed some gasoline, um, put it on some birch bark, and used that welding sparker to start up the gasoline. And that was just something I kept in my pocket the whole rest of the time. Like, do not under any circumstances lose this. So, yeah, fire starter is great. And you, you uh, graciously gave me one in your uh, care package. And I'm super <laughs> thankful for it. Yeah, those. Uh, that was an awesome gift. I, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, these days, everybody's got a big lighter, right? You know, carries a lot of lighters. But you know, if you've been in a scenario where that ladder gets soaked or you lose it or you drop it it's amazing you know having a fire starter there that you can use hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times that you know like a fire steel that you could just wipe off light it up you know you get pretty efficient in that in a short period of time especially when you're counting on it for warmth every day yeah what was the brand that you sent me do you Remember? I think that uh, I'm not sure which brand I sent you. I think one of the uh, local guys uh, put that one together. I think it's got some horn and some leather, and that's similar to the one I carry in my pack. I, I'm the same way. I always have to have three, four, five different ways to start uh, start fires. These days, all of my zippers, my backpacks, yeah. and my jackets, you can uh, order some pretty small ones off uh, Amazon, too. I just replaced all my zipper poles mm-hmm. on a lot of my gear. So basically every piece of my gear that has a zipper, it's got some sort of fire stick on it because oh that's a great idea oh that's 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 an amazing yeah, idea. you know be able to have anything you know to, ha- Holy to have have it there 24 7 because i mean i imagine um you know if i didn't have a fire or imagine if you didn't have a fire in this scenario i mean it's oh, cold. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, surviving that long yeah. in a snow cave. I mean, did did you end up having any, any cold weather injuries after this, or uh, any injuries to speak of after after you got out of there? 
I I lost uh, some skin on my hands and on my nose, um, and I'm sure I had some frostbite pretty bad on my nose, um, but I didn't have a mirror to see, and I never got to the point of no return because I still have my nose. I can still feel it okay, um, and it still looks good. So I I I think I was good. I I'm very happy about that. My toes got a little nasty and. But uh, I never got to the point of no return on them. Didn't have to lose one. Well, it certainly sounds like your base survival knowledge, you know, going in there is really what uh, determined, you know, your, you know, how you came out of it and how well you did on there. I I can imagine somebody with a lot less survival knowledge being in that scenario would have turned out a lot differently for them. I mean, learning, I mean, just, I think so, just yeah. knowing the snow cave and how to, uh, how to build one. I mean, just that before building your, uh, shelter so you could have heat. I mean, seven days, if you didn't know how to properly build a snow cave and those temperatures, you probably would have, uh, froze a far before, <laughs> before, um, you know, putting together your shelter or getting found for sure because 20 mm -hmm. you ended up being yeah. 23 days out there is that correct yeah oh, yeah 23 days that's awesome and definitely a, a testament to your spirit and, and you know your knowledge and determination to survive so Thank you. um we'll uh appreciate wrap it. this up we appreciate your time and uh telling us a story being able to absolutely hear this firsthand for our listeners and being able to learn some lessons uh and for some people that might be thinking um the same uh same dream going forward and have the same goals as you i mean everybody you know they yeah. look at alaska and think about their goals and the trips and it's pretty easy to uh get stuck in this mindset that you know i'm you know, it might rain or, you know, have some terrible weather or something at some point, but a lot of people don't think about the worst case scenarios and how to prepare for them. And it sounds like you yeah. were really well prepared and it really turned out uh, for you and really made the difference in the scenario. So we appreciate your time. Appreciate you joining yeah. us on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pleasure, Caleb. Right, thanks, Tyson. It was good talking to you. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You too. Have a good one. All right, folks, that was another episode of the Alaska Outdoors podcast brought to you by Explore Alaska. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, uh, join us next time. Uh, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by us, Explore Alaska. Check out some of our awesome products online at explorealaska.org. More information and about the Alaska Outdoors and to listen to some more stories we've got coming up for you. I came from the mud. There's dirt on my hands Strong like a tree There's roots where I stand Oh, I've been running from the law Hope they won't shoot me down soon They sing Try to catch me howling at the moon